Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Haya Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And what we mean by that, friends, is that all the questions that we have in this life, about this life, about our walk with God, about our dealings with others, how we are to rule ourselves, what is right and what is wrong, all of those answers come from the authority of the Word of God. There is no book like it. It is outside of our time dimension. It is a gift from God guiding us as we make our journey to the kingdom. And so it stands alone, and every argument, every debate is answered upon the authority of the Word of God, both for your life and for the world that we live in. Well, friends, today is December the 31st in the year of our Lord, 2017, and this is One a Day for the Soul. Now, we're continuing our study in the book of Romans, and when we were last together, we talked about a very could be controversial passage, uh, Romans chapter 9. And the reason that it is so controversial is because it speaks so very clearly about election, about predestination, topics that most people don't understand and really don't want to study because they're afraid of what they might find. And it is the same idea that leads us into chapter 10. Now, you have to keep in mind, and this is very difficult for us to do, but we have to keep in mind that this is written to young Jewish believers, Jewish people that have been raised with all the custom, all the tradition, all the ritual, and all the piety that come with being a Jew. You see, there's two things that you have to understand about the Jew. One, they, in their own minds, were a superior race. They considered themselves worthy of the favor of God and everyone else unworthy. And so they were better than everyone else. And the reason was is because the almighty creator had given them his laws. He, he had not given it to anyone else. He had given it to them. And it was up to them to keep it. And by keeping it, they earn his favor. And so if you keep those two things in mind, you're going to better understand the mindset of the people as they read this letter. And when we read it, it doesn't seem like these topics are that difficult to grapple with, but you have to understand that this is as different as day and night for the original reader, the original Jew. And so Paul begins in verse 10 and says, brothers, my heart's desire, my prayer to God for Israel is that they all might be saved. For they certainly have what it takes when it comes to their zeal for God, but they are lacking in knowledge. They set about to establish their own righteousness by fulfilling the law, by keeping the law, but they refuse to submit themselves unto the righteousness of God. And the righteousness of God is the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. For Jesus, the Messiah, is the end of the law. Now notice this key word, for righteousness. Jesus isn't the end of the law. He's the end of the law in order to obtain righteousness unto God. And that's what it says. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. And Paul has already established in the earlier chapters of the book of Romans how important the law is, but we must set it in its proper priority, its proper place. It's grace first, then the law, then obedience. It's surrender, then practice. And so it took a great amount of effort for the Jewish people who had not surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. It took a great amount of effort for them to constantly be striving to earn God's favor. But Paul says in verse 8, it's as simple as this. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith. And if you will simply confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, which may be easy for us to do today, but friends, this made them a heretic among their brethren, among other Jews. They were denouncing the way other Jews looked at it, the God of the Old Testament, Jehovah, 
and they were serving a new God, a different God, the Lord Jesus. And to the Jew that had not surrendered to the Lord Jesus, this is exactly how they saw it. For the Old Testament clearly says there's only one Lord, only one God. And yet here is Paul and the other disciples preaching that Jesus is God. And in their mind, it made Jesus a second God. And that was an abomination. It was blasphemous to the Jewish people. But he says, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that he is God, that he can set you free from your sin, and you will believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so this is the first point that Paul is attacking the Jewish faith on is grace, faith over works. But remember, their second mistake was seeing themselves above all other people. And Paul says in verse 12, there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Whosoever, doesn't matter what nationality they are. Doesn't matter what color they are. Doesn't matter what race they are. The promise isn't to the Jew only. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so you, now that you are a follower of Jesus, you have a responsibility to proclaim this message to all that would listen to you. And that's what he says in the following verses, picking up in verse 14. He says, how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? And so Paul is saying, now that you are a follower of Jesus, you have a mission. And your mission is to proclaim his message. And this is how others will come into the kingdom. Because faith comes by hearing in verse 17 and hearing by the word of God. Now be careful and don't think yourself better than them because you have decided to surrender and follow the Lord Jesus for God still loves them, and he has not cast away his people, we see in 11.1. But he's caused a spirit of slumber in verse 8 to come upon them, so that in verse 11, through that slumber, salvation will come to the Gentiles, and this will provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them, or the failure of them recognizing that Jesus is Messiah, if this is to be the riches of the world and the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness when God brings them back in, when God opens their eyes, when he reveals truth unto them. For in verse 16, if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. So don't boast against the branches in verse 18, because you were grafted in because they were broken off. And if they, because of unbelief, were broken off in verse 20, and you stand by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God. Notice what it says there. Behold the goodness of God and the severity of God that there is a perfect balance in God of both, both of reward and of judgment. On those who fail, we see his severity. We see his judgment. But upon those who have surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ, we see his goodness, his reward. If, again, a huge if, if thou continue in his goodness. Well, what happens if I don't continue in his goodness, you might ask? Otherwise, thou shalt be cut off, removed, severed, fallen from grace, lose your salvation. However you want to say it, the message is very clear. In the goodness of God, you will remain within the family of God. But if you do not continue in his goodness, you will be cut off from the family of God. You will be separated from the family of God. How people who stand, even biblical theologians, how they stand upon the idea of once saved, always saved, I'll never understand. The only way that I can see they hold to such misguided truth is because they approach the Bible with the presupposition that once saved, always saved is a biblical truth. And to let go of that means to deny everything that they have believed their whole life. 
and that is too unsettling for them. But the Bible is so very clear. I mean, take, for instance, Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore, we ought to give more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast in every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? How shall we escape what? The judgment of God, a just recompense of reward for our transgression and our disobedience. Look at Hebrews 10. Verse 26, if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. Well, if the sacrifice of Jesus and the forgiveness of sins does not apply to your life anymore because you willfully are living in a perpetual state of sin rather than surrendering to the truth of God's word, friends, that simply means you're lost. You're not a part of the family of God. And so because of this, there should be a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries, the enemies of God, which by your sinful life you now show that you are his enemy. And so in verse 29, of how much sorer punishment suppose you shall he be thought worthy who's trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. He once was saved. He once was sanctified, but now he has counted that an unholy thing. For in verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so back to Romans chapter 11, verse 22, Paul says, if you remain in the goodness of God, if you continually surrender yourselves to the things of God, you will continue in his goodness. But if not, you will be cut off. Now, just as God in verse 23 is able to graft those unbelievers back in, speaking of the Jewish unbelievers, so shall he graft in back into his family those who will recognize their sin, repent of their sin, surrender to his will, and strive to live faithfully for him. And so it isn't God that gives up on men, it's men that give up on God. For God is faithful and true, full of mercy and compassion and goodness. And that's why Paul ends the chapter by saying of God and through God, of Jesus and through Jesus, of the Spirit and through the Spirit are all things. And it is unto him be glory forever and ever. And it is this idea that will lead us into chapter 12 when Paul says, understanding this, I beg of you, brothers, I beg of you, sisters, by the very mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This is what you were saved for, to see yourself as a slave of God, a slave of righteousness, And it is your utmost desire to live the rest of your life as faithfully before him as you possibly can. So do not be conformed to the world that you live in, but be transformed. Just like a butterfly is transformed from a caterpillar through the metamorphosis process, you too be transformed. When that butterfly comes out of that cocoon, he looks nothing like what he once looked like. And that's what this Greek word is telling us. Be transformed. Don't look anything like the person you were before. That person is dead. We know that from Romans chapter 6. He's continually being crucified. And so do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you transform yourself? By changing all the things around you? No, it's changing your mind, your perception, the way that you see things. You have to learn to hate sin the same way that God hates sin. And once you see sin through the eyes of God, you are far more unlikely to commit such sins because you have renewed your mind, you've opened your eyes, and you see things differently. And that's where we're going to leave off today, friends, because Romans chapter 12 is a powerful chapter. And so we don't want to rush through it, but I do want to whet your appetite. So go and read Romans chapter 12 before our next time together, because it's very practical advice 
on how to walk upon this earth as a follower of the Lord Jesus. Well, friends, I'm so blessed that you're again with us. I'm honored that you've taken time out of your day to spend some time in the Word of God. And I pray that the Word of God is having a direct impact on your life, in your life, through your life, and that you are becoming a better follower of Jesus each and every lesson, each and every step along the way. Now, may your journey be blessed today, friends. May your hearts be full of joy and your lips full of praise. Now, as the Lord Jesus wills, and until next time, I truly love you, friends. I'll see you on the next video.